Hey, special Sunday this morning, isn't it? Pentecost Sunday. Now, obviously, for those that know our church, we're a Pentecostal church. So this day is a significant one for us as a church, the Apostolic Church. Um, and we're just going to learn this morning about waiting. Now, we know that we've been going through this series called Waiting, and we've, we've learned a lot. Last week, we learned from Pastor Arwell talking about waiting in this place of refuge, cities of refuge. And then we've learned from various people over a few, last few months about different aspects of waiting, waiting on a promise, waiting in the wings, waiting on justice, all these different elements of waiting. Well, today, we're going to change our focus a little bit, and we're going to think about the early disciples, these bunch of early disciples, Jesus' disciples, in the early, early days of the church. In fact, you could probably say even before the church was birthed. So we're going to think about how they waited, waited on the Spirit. And in particular, I've just got a couple, well, a couple's maybe underselling it. I've got four quick principles that we can pull out of how they waited, and I think we can apply them to our lives that will help us also when we wait on the Spirit. Because one thing that we've got in common with the early disciples is that they were eager for the things of God. And surely we're a church that is eager as well for the things that God has for us. So let's see what we can learn from them and apply in our context today and see what the Lord does. Let's just pray. Lord, we want to just turn as we did, as we worshiped you through song. Um, this also is an act of worship. It's an act of worship as we come to your word and as we just give you, Holy Spirit, your place. And we ask that you are the one that comes and does the teaching today, that you are the one that just interacts with us mentally and emotionally and spiritually, that the words that I share, Holy Spirit, I pray that you just take hold of them and use them as you would to refine us and to de define us and to just bring us more and more into likeness of Jesus. Um, and again, not for our own benefit necessarily, although we will benefit from that, but we, we know we live in the midst of an aching, hurting world where there's a lot of lost people, even within a stone's throw of this church, who are in desperate need of a touch from you. And we know that you will use us to bring that touch into their lives. Um, but we know that we have to be grounded in your Holy Spirit for that to be effective and um, to do that in, in a lasting way. So bless us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're holding on to this promise, aren't we? Lamentations 3, it says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It's good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So we're going to hold on to that all the way through this series. That Lord, in your word, it says that it's good for us to wait on you. And so, Lord, we're claiming that promise. We pray that you bless us from thinking about this issue of waiting this morning. Let's just open the word. And if you've got your Bibles, let's open up. No surprises where I'm going with this, but Acts chapter 1. And I'm just going to read out a little bit of the story about what happens to these early disciples way back 2,000 years ago. Now, the context of this, as many of us will know, is Jesus was crucified, and then he was buried, and then he was resurrected. And then for probably about 40 days, he was going around with his, his crew of disciples, appearing, walking through walls, eating fish, doing all sorts of stuff that proved that he was very much resurrected. And, um, and Acts chapter 1 kind of picks it up just at the end of his time here on earth, um, just before the ascension. But let's pick it up, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. I'll read it out so you can follow along in your own Bible or you can read it out here with me. Um, I'm going to use the CEV version because I quite like the simple way it put things. But this is what it says. Theophilus, I first wrote to you about all that Jesus did and taught from the very first until he was taken up to heaven. But before he was taken up, he gave orders to the apostles he had chosen with the help of the Holy Spirit. For 40 days after Jesus had suffered and died, he proved in many ways that he had been raised from death. He appeared to his apostles and spoke to them about God's kingdom. 
while he was still with them, he said, don't leave Jerusalem yet. Wait. Now there's that word. Wait here for the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. Just as I told you he's promised to do. John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. While the apostles were still with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, are you now going to give Israel its own king again? And Jesus said to them, you don't need to know the time of these events that only the Father controls, but the Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. And then you'll tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere in the world. After Jesus had said this, and while they were watching, he was taken up into a cloud. They couldn't see him, but as he went up, they kept looking up into the sky. And suddenly, two men dressed in white clothes were standing there beside them. And they said, why are you men from Galilee standing here and looking up into the sky? Jesus has been taken to heaven, but he'll come back in the same way you've seen him go. So the Mount of Olives was about a kilometer from Jerusalem. The apostles who had gone there were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, known as the eager one, and Judas, the son of James. After the apostles returned to the city, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. The apostles often met together and prayed with a single purpose in mind. The woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, would meet with them, and so would his brothers. So we're going to pause there, and we're just going to think about this experience. Now, a lot of probably, a lot of preachers today will be speaking about the, what happened in that moment where the Holy Spirit came. But our, our series that we're looking at isn't so much that moment. It's actually thinking about what was the precursor to that moment? What did the disciples do that almost created an opportunity for that moment to come? And I think there's four things I want to tell you very quickly. And the reason I'll tell you them very quickly is because I promised to Ali that I'd be rounded up in about half an hour. So he's sitting there with his stopwatch with the kids thinking, Dave, you better keep your promises. So these are going to be four quick principles that we can learn from the life of the disciples. How did they engage with Jesus' invitation to wait that we can apply in our own context, which I believe that if we do, I believe we'll see a greater expression of the Holy Spirit in our church which ultimately is what we're after. Here's the first one. The disciples were obedient. The disciples were obedient. Now, Jesus, it's fair to say, loves a curveball. You know, the, the whole image of baseball, I'm not a baseball fan, really, but the whole image of when you throw a curveball and it catches people out a bit. It's a little bit of a, oh, didn't expect that one coming. Well, Jesus loves a curveball. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, listen to what it says in verse 3, I think it was, um, or even verse 4. It says, while he was still with them, he said this, don't leave Jerusalem yet. Wait here for the Father to give you the Holy Spirit, just as I told you he's promised to do. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this a curveball? Well, the curveball is because the disciples, the apostles, Jesus has been resurrected, and they're all thinking, great, now Jesus is back in the scene, we're finally going to see the fulfillment of what we believe he came here to do. And in their eyes, it was to basically free Israel from the tyranny of the Roman oppression that they were suffering. So they were thinking, finally, the Messiah is going to come here and lead our nation into the place that it deserves to be. We're going to be free from this. And you see that in the next verse. They say, while the apostles were still with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, are you now going to give Israel its own king again? So in their mind, they're really thinking, this is why Jesus has been resurrected, came back to life. But what they didn't fully understand is that the picture that they had, although part of it is to do with Israel, obviously, Jesus had a far bigger grander, greater vision than any of them could have ever thought. See, his plan wasn't just to redeem and restore Israel. His plan was to redeem and restore all mankind. In every nation, in every tribe, every tongue, every country, every race, every gender, Jesus' plan was far bigger, far greater and grander than the disciples 
thought. So Jesus says to them, after the disciples say, well, hold on a second, are you going to give Israel its own king again? And he says, listen, you don't need to know the time of these events that only the Father controls. So he kind of slaps them down a little bit and says, hey, remember who you are kind of thing. Don't get carried away with yourselves. Let us deal with that. But what you guys need to do is this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power. And then you'll tell everyone about me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and in everywhere in the world. So whereas the disciples' vision was for Israel, Jesus' vision was for everyone. Now, we've seen the fruit of that this morning because hands up, hands up if you are Jewish in here today. I wonder if we've got anyone Jewish. Don't think so. So we're a bunch of Gentiles sitting in a room two, well, probably, what, three, 4,000 miles away from when this event took place. No Jewish ancestry that we probably know of. And here we are in a church 2,000 years on, worshiping, serving Jesus, praying for the Holy Spirit to come just as these guys were. So Jesus' vision is being fulfilled everywhere we look. There's churches all over Aberdeen meeting today that are fulfilling the vision that Jesus had. Churches all over Scotland, the UK, all over the Western world, all over the world. And thankfully, there's churches in Jerusalem as well meeting today. So this vision that we've seen Jesus have is coming to pass. But remember the point that the principle is that they were obedient so when they were told this, when, the, when Jesus kind of said, don't worry about a king coming to Israel, this is what you need to do. Go upstairs into this room and just wait. What did they, they didn't throw their toys out the tram. They didn't kick up a fuss. They did it. They went and they waited. They just said, okay. So they might have felt a little bit disappointed, perhaps. They might have felt a little bit confused at this curveball. They, they couldn't probably, we've got 2,000 years of hindsight. They don't have that. They were probably thinking, well, okay, but they trusted Jesus because, hey, who wouldn't trust someone who's died and been resurrected again and walking through walls? I would trust someone like that. And they did too. They were obedient to what Jesus had told them to do. Now, it's important because I wonder in our lives um, if there's moments where we need to be obedient to the Lord's leading. I don't know what that might look in your situation, but sometimes the Lord will come and impress something upon you through his Holy Spirit about perhaps something you need to do or something you don't need to do. Maybe a conversation you need to have or something you need to maybe give someone or whatever it is. It could be a multitude of things. But I want to encourage you, let's be a people who strive to be obedient to the Lord, even when we don't necessarily understand the end from the beginning. If Jesus tells us to do something, let's trust that he knows what he's doing and let's follow his leading. So just like the disciples, they were obedient. Okay, second one. This one is a really important one, but they were united. They were united. Now think about what it says in verse 12. It says, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. This is the ESV I'm reading out of just now, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room this upstairs room that they were in. And then there were Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. So there's almost like a football team's worth of people there, isn't there? Now, if anyone has been part of any type of sports team or any type of team of that size, how many of us know it's very hard to get everyone to agree on one thing, isn't it? You know, um, so... Like the team that I'm most part of these days is, is Ashley and my five kids. We've got a team of seven, right? One of the biggest mistakes you can make is say you're in the car driving and you say, okay, guys, long journey ahead. Where do you want to stop? Will we stop at BK, KFC, or McDonald's? Now, I would love it if there was just this voice of harmony from the back that floated forward to say, Dad, we, we'd love to go to Tesco and get a salad, actually, because that's far healthier. But no, they never say that. <laughs> they never say that. One, one will say, BK, KFC, McDonald's. And it's like, oh my goodness, why did we even ask? We should have just said, we're going here. And you have to deal with it. 
But um, to be fair, after 12 years of parenting, that's probably what we would do now. <laughs> At the start, we're probably a bit more, where do you guys want to go? So the point is, it can be hard to get a group of people of any size to be united with one accord, no matter if they're family, no matter if they love each other. We all have differences of opinion. We've all got different styles, different ways of doing things. Um, but here we read this bunch of apostles coming together in this upstairs room. And it says in verse 14, all these with one accord. One accord. Now that word accord's interesting, especially as soon as we're in Aberdeen, because the motto of Aberdeen, I don't know if you know, but it's Bon Accord. So we've got the Bon Accord Shopping Center, right? So I don't know if many of you will know this, but Bon Accord, it comes from, there used to be a castle in Aberdeen, believe it or not. So we have, has anyone ever noticed how you have the castle gate, but there's no castle? <laughs> I wonder well, where did the castle go? So the 1300s, I think it was, there was a, a castle, a garrison situated there. Um, and I don't know if it was built by the English or whether they just took it over, but anyway, the English basically had this garrison there, and, and I guess we're controlling Aberdeen. Well, anyway, Robert the Bruce and his band of merry men went and basically, I think, burned the castle to the ground, effectively. But they used the password, I think, to get into the gates or something like that, which was Bon Accord. That was the password that allowed them to get in and I guess maybe yeah, bring their plan into place. Bon Accord. So it means good agreement. Bon Accord. Good agreement. So that's where this, this word accord we get. One accord. So the disciples were of Bon Accord. They were of this good agreement. They all were in harmony, in one accord. Now that, that's something special because unity doesn't just happen. It, it, you can't just bung a bunch of people together and expect them to be united. Unity actually takes hard work. It, it's not something that just happens left its own devices. Generally what happens is things break down. They, they become less organized. They become more chaotic. That's the second law of thermodynamics. I don't know how that applies to unity, but it must have some connection, right? That's what happens in the natural realm. But in re the relational realm, the same thing happens. Unity must be worked towards, it must be nurtured, it must be protected. And so as a church, we need to think about our place in that. How can we become Christians who um, are fostering unity in this place? Because our church can grow towards even greater unity. And as we become more united and one, more, and more and more in one accord, then I think the Holy Spirit will work even more powerfully through us. So they were united. So they were obedient, they were united. Third one, very importantly, was they were persistent. They were persistent. So, you'll remember, Jesus says, go up into this upstairs room and wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, roughly, they're thinking the disciples and the apostles and whoever else was with them were probably up there for about 10 days. If you do the math, it kind of works out. They're probably upstairs in this upper room for about 10 days, right? Now, I've been challenged by this one because if you think about it, how would you react if the, a church email came out tomorrow to say, guys, we're calling the church into 10 days of prayer in the upstairs room. Please be there every single evening for 10 nights on the bounce. I wonder how you would react to that. I, I know for me, I'm the pastor, I'd be like, whoa, 10 days? Hold on a second. I've got a lot to do over the next 10 days. You know, I've got A, B, and C. I've got to be here, there, and everywhere. Um, I'm not sure how many of us would feel that up for that, if I'm being honest. But this is what Jesus asked them to do. In fact, he didn't even say 10 days. He just said, go up and wait. They, they could have been signing up for two months, six months. Who knows how long this is going to take? He didn't say, but he says, in a few days, the Holy Spirit's going to come. So they were trusting him with that. But it challenged me to think, how much do I really, really want to see the Holy Spirit breaking into my life? Can I really, with integrity, stand up here and say, every, every moment, every day, I'm just, that's my focus? Probably not, if I'm being honest. And that's a challenging thing to say. But I, I have a heart to get there. 
I would like to be the type of Christian who has this soul focus of, Lord, I'm so desiring your things, the Holy Spirit to break into my life in a more powerful way that I'm prepared to sacrifice other things in my life. The other things that really are pretty fruitless when I look at them, but yet we esteem them so highly. Persistent. Man, they met there day after day. They prayed together. It says that in our account here, with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. Can you imagine if on day nine, they had just decided, it's been nine days, guys, week and a half, nearly, come on, we've had enough of this, let's go. And imagine they packed it in just before the breakthrough happened. Man, I don't know, I don't know what the story would have been written after that, you know, how Jesus would then have <laughs> brought things about, I don't know. But I was thinking about it this week. Imagine they gave up on day nine, just before the breakthrough. And I wonder if there's a lesson in that for us. I wonder if there's something in your life that it feels like you've been bashing on at day after day, maybe week after week. And maybe it's something you've been praying about. And you've just been seeing nothing happening. And it's like, Lord, come on. You've been doing this for nine days. You've been doing this for nine months doing this for nine years, maybe nine decades for some of us, who knows? And we just haven't seen it. So you know what? I'm just going to admit defeat and give in. The apostles could have fallen into that trap. They could have said, nine days is, is long enough for us. We need to go back. We need to earn money. We need families to feed. Let's go back onto the boats, get some fish. But they didn't. They hung it out for the length of time that was needed. They were persistent. Let me show you a little video that I think might encourage some of you just now about the principle of persistence. Let's pop up on the screen. Now look at this. This is over in India somewhere. And these guys are trying to bash these rocks apart and they're hitting it with this little hammer. Now come on, how long are you going to have to hit that with a hammer for to make any impact on this rock? You'd be there until the cows come home, surely. But we'll just watch what happens. And now they swap over. Different one comes up, takes over, has a little bash. Gosh, there's no change. And you can imagine these two people are sitting there thinking, oh, come on, you know, how long have we got to do this for? <laughs> there's smaller rocks over there, guys, we can try hitting. But they keep going. And now he's getting a little bit tired, you see? Because being persistent is hard work. It's not easy being persistent. Now this chap takes over. He gives it a little go. Now, you just think how hot that must be there, how difficult a task that must be. And from the outside, we're looking and thinking, why on earth are you even bothering trying to do that? But let's keep watching. Let's just see what happens. Over and over, hammering away with no visible results whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, look at that. Boom. Isn't that incredible? Like, you just think about those, now they were hammering pins into the rock. And it's the same technique I think they used to use here to split the granite, right? And you just think, over and over, how many, and they've probably, that's only a little video, they've probably been doing that for hours maybe, but hit after hit after hit, no difference, it seems like, on the surface. And then that last one, boom, and you saw the whole thing just crack right up and fall over. There's things like that in our lives. I'm sure there are things like that in your life where it feels like this, it feels like you've been bashing away at it forever it feels like <laughs> you've just seen nothing all you all you've got is sore arms and a blunt hammer and you're thinking goodness me nothing's going to change what's the point well imagine that guy before that last one had just said oh nothing's changing here lads let's go and get some lunch 
They would never have done it, would they? It would never have. And all it needed was one more tap. Who knows about the issue in your life that just needs one more tap? The, the health issue that you've got, that you've prayed about for years, perhaps. Nothing's happened. Where's the healing in it, God? The, the friend that you just long to become a Christian and you've never seen that happen. Who knows what it is? The financial situation, perhaps, that you're facing, that it just feels desperate. And it's like, oh, God, there's, I've tried time and time again. I've tried to be persistent, and it just doesn't seem to change. Hey, you could be one tap away from seeing that situation completely collapse and turn around. So what the disciples did, and it's something we can learn from them, that they were persistent. They stayed the course. They, they did it. And it's a bit like Jacob, and he wrestled with God. He says, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And remember, he walked away with a limp, but he got a blessing. And we need to be like that with God. Let's, as a church, let's wrestle him almost and say, Lord, we're not letting go of you until you bless us, until we see even greater things, until we see a fuller expression of the Holy Spirit in our own lives and in the lives of our church. Because we can't be satisfied with what we have, surely. Surely there's more. Surely an eternal God, an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-being God, surely there's more than we've experienced in my lifetime anyway. And let's go after that. Let's be persistent. Okay, number four, lastly, they knew when to stop waiting. They knew when to stop waiting. Now, this is an important one because we've been talking a lot about waiting for the last few months. And if we're not careful, we can fall into perhaps a trap of thinking, well, we'll just keep waiting forever. But that's not the Lord's purpose here. It's not the Lord's plan for us as a church, and it wasn't the Lord's plan for the disciples just to stay in that upper room and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. No, no, there was a purpose behind the waiting. The purpose was that so when they encountered God, they then left the upper room. So let's read a little bit into chapter two. We'll put it up on the screen as well. Um, I'll maybe skip forward a little bit. But this is what it says. Um, so on the day of Pentecost, beginning of chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, all the Lord's followers were together in one place. And suddenly there was a noise from heaven, like the sound of a mighty wind. It filled the house where they were meeting. And then they saw what looked like fiery tongues moving in all directions. And a tongue came and settled on each person there. The Holy Spirit took control of everyone and they began speaking whatever languages the Spirit let them speak. So there's the moment, the moment of breakthrough, the moment where this big rock finally falls. is like, wow, you feel this wind blowing through the house. Can you imagine being there? Now, I had a small, very small glimpse of what that was like because I was in here doing some sermon prep upstairs, funnily enough. Um, this is quite a funny story, but in some ways it's sad that this is the closest I've got to this experience. I was upstairs doing some sermon prep and it was getting a bit cold. So I came downstairs, turned the heating on. Now, you know we've got an air-blowing heating system in this church, right? And it's quite noisy when it gets switched on. So it takes a minute to kick in. So by the time it, I went back upstairs and I was doing something, and I heard this, like, this air starting to, like, <laughs> Now, I was hoping that it might not be the heating. It might be something else. But it was the heating, unfortunately. But surely it births something within us, doesn't it? About Maybe our experience would be different to this. But it's like, Lord, I don't want to just read about these things. I want to experience them. I don't want to just be a Christian who's happy to go on, you know, the records of other people. Like, for example, I read um, Erica and Alice's grandfather, Pastor Samuel McKibben, who many of you will know, who's written a book, which I recommend anyone reading who's got it, called God and the Miraculous, I think it is. Short little book, but really amazing stories in it. And it's, it's lovely reading a book from someone you know, isn't it? But I, I, the thing I came away from reading that made me think, Gosh, I don't want to just read someone else's stories. I want stories of my own. I, I, I would like to write a book one day in a few decades. Here's how God worked in my life. Here's the things that I've seen, not going on secondhand testimony. 
So they knew when to stop waiting. Here's the point. The Holy Spirit comes in power. Uh, the wind blows through. The fire descends upon them. Now, if there's a, a parallel to a lot of churches in this moment, we'd be tempted just to say, oh, great, the Holy Spirit's moved. What we'll do is we'll set up a set of revival meetings and we'll invite everyone upstairs into the upper room, okay? And people can come inside to experience this type of thing. But that's not what happened. What happened is the disciples, the apostles, went out. And we know that because there was people all over the, the city hearing their voices and their languages that they're speaking. And they're thinking, what is going on here? Quite chaotic in some ways, but like a beautiful chaos, isn't it? So the disciples went out. They knew that the period of waiting was over. They knew that actually the purpose of being inspired and, and, and filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit isn't just so that we can have a nice Christian time in some kind of church or building like that and just enjoy it and then pack up and go home. The purpose of it is so that as we're changed, we then go out into the community and that power comes and changes everyone. Now remember what Jesus says, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. That was his vision. Now it started in this little upper room in Jerusalem, but it didn't end there. That was just like the match getting struck and then poof, it explodes to the point where now we're sitting here 2,000 years later in a church in Northeast Scotland worshipping the same God with the same scriptures as these guys had. But the point is they knew when to stop waiting. Listen to what Peter says. So they went out into the streets. Everyone's looking at them thinking, these guys are drunk because they're acting so crazily and they're like speaking all these languages. They must be drunk. But Peter stood up and he says this. This is, I'm not sure what verse it is, but um, chapter two. He says, friends and everyone else living in Jerusalem, listen carefully to what I have to say. You're wrong to think that these people are drunk. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. I mean, come on. <laughs> nine o'clock in the morning which kind of tells you one thing, doesn't it? That they were there early to pray, which is interesting. But this is what God told the prophet Joel to say. When the last days come, I'll give my spirit to everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I'll give my spirit to my servants, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I'll work miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will turn dark and the moon will be red as blood before the great and wonderful day of the Lord appears. Then the Lord will save everyone who asks for his help. But listen to what he says now. He says this. Now, listen to what I have to say about Jesus from Nazareth. I think that's so interesting that he has this lineup of things that he says, but then he says, now, listen to what I have to say about Jesus from Nazareth. Now, what we have to realize is the Holy Spirit's work is to give, you know, bring glory to the Son. It's to point people towards Jesus. So look what Peter's doing. This is the same Peter that dis not despised Jesus, but rejected Jesus three times before his death, right? Now, in the space of what, 50 odd days, He's suddenly been turned around into this person who's happy to stand up in a public space in Jerusalem and say, now, listen to what I tell you about Jesus of Nazareth. And then he goes on and shares some amazing things that eventually leads to 3,000 people becoming saved and getting baptized. So what is it that's changed in Peter's life? It's that he's encountered the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and boom, encountered him, changed him, but it's done it for Peter's benefit, yes. But the net effect of it is that Peter has now gone onto the streets and his sole focus is to bring people towards Jesus. And this again, this is what we must capture from this. The Holy Spirit in our own lives is, is wonderful and it's great and it's something we should seek. But let's not stop there. Let's not get into this mindset, a bit like what the early disciples thought of, they can only see Israel. This must be about Israel's king, yeah? We can sometimes have a similar analogy, which is like, 
Holy Spirit, come and work in my life. I want you to work in my life. And now that's important. It's good. It's healthy. But it needs to be bigger and broader than that. Jesus' vision isn't just for me and you. It's for each and every person living in this world. God's heart is that no one should perish, that all should come to faith, that all should be saved. And we've got a part to play in that. As we are filled, as we are changed by the Holy Spirit, and we go out into the street, let's do what Peter did. Let's turn people back towards Jesus. So they knew when to stop waiting. And it's going to be important for us to hold on to this principle because there's a coming a season in our church when we're not going to wait anymore. The time of waiting will end. And it's about, okay, Lord, we're going to do So these disciples went from being in the upper room, praying, waiting, and then they met and were encountered by the Holy Spirit. And it changed it. The dynamic shifted. They then went out and brought the gospel with them. And as a church, we're in this place just now where we're waiting for the Lord to lead us, to guide us, to empower us. But that's going to end soon, I think. And soon we'll be going out. We'll be sent out transform this world just like the early disciples did so four little principles that i wanted to share with you that touched my life from the lives of the disciples that i think we need to just grab hold of and remember for our own lives and the life of this church let's be a church that is obedient towards the things that god leads us into let's obey him when he leads Let's stay united, and that will require effort. It will require a persistent attitude of refusing to allow anything in that will drive a wedge between us. Let's be persistent in our prayer lives. Let's be persistent. Let's not give in just one blow away from the breakthrough. Let's encourage each other to keep going as well. And then lastly, let's keep in mind that this season of waiting is going to come to an end shortly and I'm excited to see how the Lord leads us forward after that and who knows how he might move let's not get into this you know trap of trying to box in the Lord but I wonder who needs a touch a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit today let's believe that's possible let's believe he can interrupt your life invade your life like Jared talked about earlier in a way that will change you and the people that you're in contact with. So let's just pray. Lord Jesus, as we just come to you again and we just sing some simple songs of worship towards you, just send your Holy Spirit. Our church is nothing without your Holy Spirit, Lord, leading us and filling us, empowering us. We don't want to be this dry, dusty church with a head full of knowledge, but no experience of the living God. We want to invite you in, even in these moments. Come and meet with us, change us, do something within us, Lord. Um, I don't know what that will look like, but you know the needs here, Holy Spirit. And we just give this time over into your hands to do what you want to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, as a church, we just want to, without any frills, we just want to say, we want to be a church that experiences everything you have for us. We know that we come to you with our baggage. We know that we come to you with our preconceptions, our insecurities, and that's okay, because we know that you know that. But with all of that said, you see our heart, Lord. Our heart is to be a church that is just in love and on fire for you. To be a church that um, cares about you enough to obey you cares you enough about you to be persistent in going after you. And I pray that in the days ahead, in the weeks ahead, as we spend time waiting further in your presence, that your, your presence would just come by your Holy Spirit and just in greater and greater frequency and greater and greater intensity, we would experience the things that you have for us, Lord. Please blow our vision apart from being the disciples that are happy to settle for you becoming king of Israel 
to a, a group of disciples who then realized that you're the king for the entire world. Let us be a people in this church that are steadfastly going after not just your kingdom and your power being poured out in this building, but that we see our community that we live in, we see the city that we live in, the country that we live in, our nation, our continent, and we're going after the Lord, not because of anything we are or because of anything we've done, but because of who you are and who you've done. And we know as we submit to you and as we're empowered by you, you can do great things through insignificant people like us. So we hand it over to you, Lord. We're here, we're available, we're hungry for you, and we're looking for more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.